Welcome, my beautiful listeners. Hey, this episode is all about why I'm supporting the Trucker Rally and how we got to this point here in Canada with respects to your health and what it means for you moving forward. Stay tuned. Stop making an old man sounds. Yeah, that's right. You know what I'm talking about. Those aches, those pains that cause you to groan every time you get out of your chair or into your car. That's not normal. Start getting after it by getting your copy of the Nimble Warrior book. This is a book that I created in order to start fixing things like back pain, knee pain, shin splints, you name it. In order to get your hands on a copy, you have to head to thenimblewarriorbook.com and you can pick this book up for just the cost of shipping and handling. Additionally, for every book that you purchase, I'll be donating $1 to the Warrior Adventures Canada charity here in Canada that helps veterans get back on their feet by going out into the wilderness and doing some really interesting excursions. So head to the nimblewarriorbook.com, get your copy today, and start getting nimble immediately. Welcome to the Hard to Kill podcast, the go-to podcast for military, LEO, and EMS professionals, sharing ideas and experiences from around the world to make you hard to kill. Here's your host, Dave Morrow. All right, here we go, folks. Today is Friday, and it is the 28th of January. Um, tomorrow, if you're unaware, there is the largest convoy in human history heading <laughs> to Ottawa. This is insane. So you may have picked it up on the news, or you may have picked it up on social media, but this is the real deal. So all across Canada, all the way from BC, all the way now down to Ottawa and from the East Coast, from the States, truckers are given the big middle finger to vaccine mandates and it's about time. Look, whether you think vaccination is important, whether you don't think it's important, at this point, we're well past the basic medical issues that were present at the start of this pandemic. We've now created a health emergency into a political one. This is the exact thing that politicians are supposed to avoid. And therefore, Canadians are fed up and pissed off because you've been confused, lied to, made to feel like idiots, and divided. This isn't what Canada is about. Canada is about unity. We've been told since day one, we're a multicultural, pluralistic, happy, Good time people, man. We're peacemakers. But all we're seeing now is this divisive line and it's coming from the top. So I'm glad the truckers are saying, fuck you. Because you know what? It takes somebody to get pushed a little bit too far and to say enough's enough. This rally has been, wow, it's been good for morale for me anyways. And I think it's been good for morale for everybody across Canada because we all have this kind of uneasy feeling and if you listen to one of my previous podcasts it's what i call the alt middle which is a term that i borrow from dr peter atia that have questions aren't crazy and want to be heard but all we get is punitive measures and a lockout and lockdown from our governments we're fed up and we're seeing this play out over the entire country now. The Americans have picked this up. The British have picked this up. This is turning into something that I don't think our political overlords, our emperors are really paying attention to well enough because this is a large scale civil disobedient activity unseen here before in Canada. So this is pretty momentous. And I want to go through a few of the things that have come up on the radar because things are coming fast and furious. We can't keep up with all the new information that comes our way. And that's problematic. However, we need to take a step back and listen to some really good experts. And I'm going to act as a conduit to those experts as best as I can. Because ultimately, why do I do all this? It's to improve everybody's health as best as possible. So I give you as much alpha as possible. I try to give you the the clearest way to improving your health without having to listen to really poor messaging coming from our health officials. And that's case in point, we're all sick, we're all mentally broken, and we're not living and thriving anymore. We're just existing. So if this podcast can help you get to that next point, that next level, that next step in your journey, awesome. And if I can do it by promoting some really awesome human beings that have much more nuanced and much 
better levels of understanding of what we're dealing with right now, then that's what I'm here for. So I want to start off with a few things. Essentially, we're seeing this trucker convoy and there's a lot of things to put into this, right? Um, you may be frustrated about, in my case, I'm really frustrated that all our sports activities are, are canceled, especially for my kids. Okay. It sucks for me. I really like playing hockey. I really like playing my Irish sports. I really like being at the gym. I'm a communal guy. You've shut that down. Not happy. But what I'm especially not happy with is my son not being able to go to the pool and swim. My son not being able to go play the normal sports that he does in the winter. This, this is unacceptable. Um, and I think a lot of you are starting to feel that. And uh, that's one of the main reasons I'm going. But also, I don't like knowing that my government could just shut down everything the parliamentary process for years without having any input, that to me is unacceptable. That's unsatisfactory at a fundamental level. That's not how we operate as a government. That's not how our principles are set up. And that is definitely not how our constitution is set up. That's a whole other discussion for another time. I don't want to get too deep into the politics, but ultimately for me, it's the health side of things. If they were concerned about our health, they would have enacted very practical health related measures that would have improved our health, not degraded our health. So let's just look at some of the numbers here and I'll post some of the links uh, or all the links to all of this content uh, in the show notes that are going to be really brief here on Apple. Um, and I'll do a more detailed deep dive on my website at davemorrow.net slash hard to kill pod. Okay. So uh, first things first, it's hard to keep up. Uh, and essentially we're getting deluged with new information and it's not really possible to to put it all in context just yet because we're kind of in shell shock. We're fearful. A lot of us are also scared to even take a position on mandates, on vaccines because we've been pummeled. We've been bullied into a position that if you have any questions, you're an anti-vaxxer and you're a racist and a misogynist. And that is unsat. That's unacceptable. So let's just go over some of the new data that I've come across. A lot of it comes from the UK, interesting enough, but some of it's from the States as well. Um, there is some Canadian data, but I'd, I'd much rather use other countries' data. And yeah, I'm biased to larger data sets like the UK and, 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 uh, and the US. Um, but additionally, Canadian data isn't nearly as good as the other countries. I'll, I'll be totally honest from what I can see. Now, if you do have a really good data sets from Canada, I, I'm more than willing to, to look at them. Actually, I'd love to look at them. If you, if you want to send me a message, please do on Facebook um, and send me, some, send me some new data, really, because um, the UK and, and the Americans do a much better job at this. So um, first things first, COVID is constantly on the radar. And now it's getting on the radar for reasons that are related to COVID, but not the actual disease itself. So here's the first one. Um, I'm pulling up a study here from the UK. And uh, the study is related to mental health and well-being impacts of lockdown for children and young people. Now, being a dad, this is my main concern. This is my main effort, my kids. Okay, I think most parents out there can get a grip of that, that it's no longer about me so much as making sure that my kids are good, my, my lineage is protected. Okay. Um, I'm not doing well with my mental health. I already had mental health issues before this pandemic. And I think it's safe to say that most of us have been really affected to the point where we might not even realize how deep the, the hurt and deep the, the, you want to call it trauma goes. Um, and it's especially prevalent in our kids. Uh, now my, my kids haven't started school yet. They're in, they're in daycare. But they are going. To, one of them is going to school next year, and uh, the fact that I'm not doing well, the fact that I know my wife isn't doing nearly as well as she used to be, um, this has a trickle down effect on your kids, and uh, the evidence is starting to show that. So I'll just read a little piece here that I have pulled up on the screen. Um, so with uh, lockdown, so in this case, I'm just going to read straight from the um, straight from the study here. Um, so in this case, and they're talking about SARS-CoV-2, so COVID-19, uh, criteria for PTSD, so post-traumatic stress disorder, was met by 30% of quarantined children. So a study from India during the COVID-19 pandemic yields similar results, and further studies conducted in China find that young people report increased depressive symptoms and anxiety symptoms. 
and can experience negative psychological consequences as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic. Okay, so the reason why I bring that up is obviously we cannot sacrifice our kids' mental health at this early an age for something that has a negligible, and when I say something, I mean the virus has a negligible effect on their population. It is nowhere near as deadly as for the 65 and older crowd. Okay, so the consequences here are, are long lasting, in my opinion. How, how do you justify now keeping lockdowns, keeping restrictive school policies, closing schools, when you know there is evidence here, and this is one of many studies, so don't get me wrong here. This is one I'm just pulling up because it's convenient um, and it's easy enough uh, data to, to read out, but this is across the board, folks. So, okay, point number one, our kids aren't doing well. Point number two, childhood ob obesity. And this is from uh, The Lancet, which is uh, one of the premier peer-reviewed journals on the planet. And um, in a study here in the U.S., uh, so the there was a reported increase in recreational screen time of almost four hours a day in children aged 12 to 13. Uh, during the COVID-19 pandemic. The effects of these lifestyle changes can be seen in CDC Morbidity and Mortality Weekly Report, which notes that the rate of BMI increase almost doubled in U.S. children and adolescents aged 2 to 19 years during the pandemic compared to pre-pandemic. In turn, obesity and overweight are also risk factors for severe COVID-19 outcomes, at least in adults. Okay. Now, Looking at this data here, you'd say, oh my God, it's doubled. I, I mentioned that obesity rates have doubled. Um, it's not quite true, so I need to correct myself on that. So BMI increase almost doubled in U.S. children and adolescents aged 2 to 19. BMI increase doubled. So that means uh, your BMI, which is your body mass index, the rate of increase has doubled. So it's gone from a, a study that I read previously, it's gone from about 1% to 2%. Put that in context. Okay, so the BMI, which is a is a general understanding of overall health, needs to be at 25. And that's just taken from massive data sets from human beings across the planet. So it's based on height and body weight. It's a really simple calculation. You can put it in a calculator on the internet. I use it with my clients all the time. It gives you an idea like, hey, are you obese? Because if you're 25 and over, so if the value of your BMI is 25 to 30, you're overweight. And if it's 30 and above, you're obese. 35 and above, you're morbidly obese. Okay, as you go up that BMI scale, your chances of chronic disease, illness, diabetes, you name it, starts to go up rapidly. When children are obese, it is essentially a death sentence. It's an early death sentence. The data is very conclusive on this. If you're exposing your children to obesity at an early age with poor nutrition habits, poor exercise habits, the chances of them having things like diabetes, type 2 diabetes at a really early age goes through the roof. Okay, Diabetes is one of the leading causes of death and coronary heart disease down the road. The fact that we flippantly look at diabetes like, oh, it's just a chubby kid is really troubling to me and has been troubling to me for a long time. And this is partly why I work so hard with veterans and the, the military community. Uh, I want them to be the example for their children because you showing the example and losing body weight, losing body fat will demonstrate to your children, like my dad did for me, that being fit and healthy is important. If being fit and healthy is important, then they will take that on and adapt because all they do is look up to us, right? All they do, it's monkey see, monkey do. So if you're fit, healthy, odds are your, your children will be fit and healthy and we can start nipping this in the bud. But the issue with that is that most people have no idea what the paradigm needs to be in order to get fit and healthy. They're doing what they've been told for 30 years, which is eat loads of crappy processed food, don't eat too many calories, stay away from meat and salt. And you know what? It's your damn fault that you're fat because you're not moving enough. So you don't eat enough. And when you do eat, it's garbage. And then you start PTing yourself to death and you go down this downward spiral of shit and then you gain more weight and you don't understand why. Okay. That's covered in, a, in, in another podcast. My last podcast, I just talked about 
why men need to eat more and eating like a 14 year old girl is not going to cut it anymore. Okay. So that's very troubling too. Increased rates of obesity in children because of the pandemic. That's unsad as well. And then lastly, regular vaccine update uptake. Okay. This is, this is really troubling. Regular vaccine uptake. So like we're talking about measles. We're talking about, you know, the, the typhus, like the, 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 the main ones, polio, like the main ones that you're supposed to get growing up, the rates of them being administered is falling dramatically. And the frustrating thing is that this was mentioned in the Great Barrington Declaration. Go back to one of my earlier podcasts on COVID and uh, we, I chatted about this because this is something that came out over a year ago from some of the most prominent doctors and virologists on the planet that said, wait a second, our policy may end up causing a hell of a lot more damage than good. Let's take a step back and think before we start enacting all these lockdowns, before we start enacting all these mandates and vaccine at all cost, because we may win the battle, but lose the war. And one of the specific things that they mentioned was vaccine uptake. We may create a generation of parents that are now completely skeptical of all vaccines because you forced this one vaccine that had a lot of questions surrounding it. And this is also one of my major concerns too. So to read this out, um, so these decreases, meaning the uptake of vaccines to uh, reverse hard-won progress, and they're talking about vaccine programs, right, for very serious deadly diseases amongst children, according to who the, the World Health Organization and UNICEF officials who warned that at least 30 measles campaigns have, have been or could be canceled. And the number of children receiving three doses of diphtheria, tetanus, and pertussis vaccine has declined for the first time in 28 years. <sighs> okay. Health officials from 82 countries participated in the web-based survey conducted in June. About 85% reported reduced routine vaccine vaccination rates in May compared with the pre-pandemic months of January and February. About half the survey respondents said that inadequate personal protective equipment for healthcare workers contributed to disruptions in immunization services. While 40% reported travel restrictions of 43% said they had too few health care workers to administer vaccines. <sighs> okay. So that's where we're at right now. The vaccines that protect our children from the most serious viruses on the planet that have a proven track record of killing them and causing serious long term repercussions are not being regularly administered anymore. That's not good either. Okay. So that's what's going on right now. Let me go a little bit more into opinion. So what's the end game strategy here? And this is something that has been bothering me for a very long time. Where do we say, okay, we're done with restrictions. We're done with all these mandates. We're just going to live with what we have which is a very natural response to any natural process. The hubris here and the arrogance that we have towards nature is outstanding. I can't even wrap my head around it. We're pretending like we can push back a nano particle, which is essentially your virus, and beat it like it's an enemy in a war. We're going to eliminate it. We're going to crush it. We're going to destroy it. That's all the the the, the verbiage and the 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 words that are being used. That's the the way that it's being crafted. That this is a war against a virus. That is an absurdity. Fighting this is 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 never going to result in, in the end result, which is seems to be zero COVID, which is a policy, but it's it's short sighted. It may give you a sense of okay, yeah, we're kicking ass and taking names. But applied to a virus, this doesn't really make much sense, especially a coronavirus like the one we're seeing now that are highly capable of mutations. And we're seeing it already. We've created a vaccine for a virus that no longer is the same virus. It's mutated itself so many times that now we're at a point where the, clearly the vaccines don't have any effect. I got COVID. I got my vaccines. So what the fuck? 
like <laughs> people that have three, four doses still get COVID. What the fuck? So how do you answer that question? Well, clearly the policy is ineffective because we're using the policy that we had two years ago and we haven't adapted this. Now, somebody who brings up this point directly as an expert is Dr. Peter Atia. When does this end? We don't have a, we don't have an end, end game. Do we just mask forever? Do we just continually every 10 weeks give a booster shot? Because in the name of safety and protecting our hospital ICU beds, that's not an end game solution. It's like playing a game of hockey with not without knowing what the rules are at the end of the game. Like, is it the amount of goals that are scored? Or scores, the amount of players that are still on the bench at the end? How many periods? Like, these are all questions that obviously get answered when you play a game. Well, when you're dealing with public policy, you need to do a cost benefit analysis and say like, okay, at this point we need to say enough's enough. I haven't heard a single politician say that. I haven't heard anybody here in Quebec say, hey, we're going to be done with this at, at this time because we will never, ever get out of this if we don't. What happens when there's another virus that pops up, like a rhinovirus or a, a, more, a more virulent form of influenza? Are we just going to constantly live in fear for that next virus that will eventually come? It's, it's inevitable, but maybe it's in 10 years. So do we just wait out for 10 years in this constant state of just living and not enjoying life? Like it is absurd. There needs to be an end game. And that takes politicians that actually give a shit. But if they're not going to give a shit, then it's up to us to actually force that. We need to call our MPs. We need to write our MPs. We need to talk to our local politicians and be like, enough's enough. I'm doing it. You should be too. Because this is not how government is supposed to work. It's not by fiat. That's not how we operate. We're not run by an emperor or a king. End state. This is critically important. Ask your politician, when does this end? Now, the truckers, this is basically their end state, right? And they're saying, look, if you're not going to create an end state for this, we are. And whether you're ready or not, we don't care. And this is because of poor policy. They didn't let us in. They didn't open our governments. They didn't listen to us. So in a good democracy, this is what happens. And I'm proud to be a part of that, man. Um, so therefore... Um, you know, a, a good point that was brought up by, and I'll get more into Dr. Peter Tia's work was that like, they're openly mocking Canada on his last podcast about COVID that we were acting like a country that was under Sharia law, no movement, full PPE at all times. Only certain people get access to services. Like this is not what I grew up with. And this is what I saw in a foreign country in Afghanistan. And it was heartbreaking to me that you would have this type of tyrannical totalitarianism in a country. I understood that this is part of the human condition, but I also wanted to impart that, you know, there's a better way clearly. And we had it up until two years ago, but it's been wiped off our books. It's basically been like, well, we're under emergency, so we can do whatever the hell we want. And no, I'm done with that. I'm done with that line of thinking. And you should be too, because for our, Democrat, for our democracy to be healthy, we need to ensure that we have public opinion, public input to public policy. So let me move on to um, some really, I guess, you want to call it bombshell data. This bombshell data comes from the UK. And um, it's pretty interesting. It uh, it comes from the office of office office of national statistics ONS in the UK. Uh, now the uh, the study I'll I'll uh, I'll put as a link. It's it's really long. Okay, um, but Dr. John Campbell in in the UK has a great YouTube channel. He's like the perfect doctor for boomers, but I watch him because he uh, he literally uses a piece of paper and shows this piece of paper as he goes through it. Like he's incorporating brand new tech with old school methods and I love it. He's very thorough and looks at things from a very, uh, very rational perspective as well. Ton of followers, like the guy gets like a million views on his YouTube channel just by going through data and using his medical lens to look at 
what this means. Now, he's surprised and I'm surprised as well that this hasn't been picked up by mainstream media because it's kind of a big deal. And I'm suspecting that they don't want to put this out there more prevalently because I think people are going to get really pissed off. Okay, so let me just look at a few of the stats and then you can go into them yourself. Okay, so what we're looking at here is a report based on a freedom of information request in the UK that came out a few weeks ago, conveniently a few days before Boris Johnson stepped down or didn't step down, but ended all the mandates across the UK. Now, are they related? I don't know. That's for you to decide. That's who knows, right? Okay, so the freedom of information request was to request the hard data on individuals that died with and of COVID-19 over the last two years in the UK. So the official date, well, yeah, the official data that has been presented to the UK of COVID-19 deaths was 137, 133 COVID deaths, which is a pretty high death toll over two years from 2020 to 2021. But in the Freedom of Information Request document, the actual total of those that died of COVID-19 with no other comorbidities, no other underlying cause, no diabetes, no heart disease, no cancer, was only 17,371. That's eight times lower than what is being presented as official numbers. Okay, so let me say that again. The, the numbers that are being presented in the UK of COVID deaths is 137, 133 over two years. But due to a freedom of information request, the number of individuals that died of COVID, not with COVID, is 17,371. Eight times lower than the official number being presented to the UK population. Now, one little caveat is that this 17,371 only includes England and Wales. It doesn't include Scotland and Northern Ireland. Good point. Okay, so that number would probably be a little bit higher. Let's say it's a few thousand higher. Let's say, you know, let's give them 25,000. Okay, but 25,000 compared to 137,133, that's a really big difference, guys. Uh, And these numbers are going to be coming out in Canada, in the US, all over the planet because the requests are in. I know the CDC has already started laying the, I guess, the rhetorical framework for when this comes out, saying that we're, we're looking into it and we're going to be releasing data soon. Um, I'm curious to know what you think of that. So if that's the case, let's ballpark it's 10 times lower rate of death than what was presented to us. So I think Canada had 30,000-ish COVID deaths. What happens if it's only 3,000 folks? What happens if all this panic related to COVID was based on skewed numbers? A statistical error? Oh boy, not to mention from UK data, the average age of death from COVID-19 was 82.5 years old. To compare that with the average life expectancy of the UK of men, which is 79, and women, 82.9, the average age of death from COVID-19 is older than the average age of death for men, and pretty much bang on for women. Um, I got some questions, like, if the average age of death is those that are older than their life expectancy, then wouldn't it have made sense just to focus on those that are most at risk? And also put in perspective that when you're old, you're going to die of shit. (laughs) Like pneumonia is the old man's friend. That's something that I learned from a doctor. You're eventually going to go out. Something's going to take you. You're not going to be able to have a rock solid immune system and live forever. That's clearly a irrational thought to hold that you're going to live forever something's going to take you down man if it's covid cool if you're in your 80s yeah i mean like the circle of life continues 
but to completely shut down all things, schools, businesses, ruin lives, not able to see your dying family members. Why? So as these numbers keep on coming out, I'm very concerned that people are going to be very pissed off and I'm pissed off looking at this. So when the Canadian data comes out, I mean, if it comes out, it'd be very interesting to see. I mean, the virus is the virus. It, we clearly see that across the planet, the response has been the same for the majority of the Western countries. So why, why wouldn't it be the same when it comes to reporting COVID deaths of not with COVID-19? Interesting uh, little development there. So moving on, uh, Peter Atia, who I reference a lot because it's cool to listen to a really smart human being who is significantly smarter than I am, who's Stanford educated, like he's just like rock star, intelligent, is a medical doctor, does treat COVID patients, has a very good successful business, is an incredible athlete, has been on Joe Rogan, you, you know, like he can hold his own anywhere basically to express the same values that I've already held before I heard him was very comforting. It was like putting on a warm blanket, like, ah, okay. I'm not on an island by myself thinking that I'm crazy because he literally lays it out in his COVID podcast and his his blogs on COVID. Now, I'm going to pull this up here. Um, This is from his blog post, which also references his podcast, which you need to immediately download and listen to. If you're not going to read the blog, read or uh, correction, listen to the podcast, either on YouTube or, or anywhere you listen to your podcast. He's done two with other doctors on a panel type discussion. It digs into every one of your major questions. The last one he did was with Dr. Monica Gandhi. And it was great to have her on because she's been a huge proponent of masking, vaccines, um, and and mandates. And what's cool is that uh, Peter Tia is very much against mandates, very much for vaccines. But it's a nuanced approach. And this has been my stance since the beginning. Protect those that are most vulnerable. The vaccine should immediately go to 65 plus. Cool. He's of the same opinion. Now, Dr. Gandhi has also been able to change her point of view, which is great to hear because that's what we're not getting. We're getting heels dug in. No, this is the only way forward. If you don't believe in this, you are some sort of piece of shit. So I want to bring up this really important point here, and it's highlighted by Peter Atia in his latest episode and on this particular blog post, which goes into a lot more depth. And I'll just read it out to you. Uh, because it's important to put things in context with respects to hospitalizations and every conversation now dovetails to, yeah, but what about the hospitals? Here is Peter Tia's perspective from a doctor who actually deals with COVID patients who treats people moving forward. So it's true that hospitals are stretched very thin right now with the nth surge of COVID. But a few things are worth keeping in mind. During a bad flu season in the U.S., recent examples would be 2017, 2018, 2014, 2015, etc. cetera, it is common for 50 to 70,000 patients to be hospitalized at any one time across the country. This is not very different from what we see today. Okay, um, which says nothing of the fact that roughly half the hospitalized COVID patients have incidental infections, meaning they are actually there for something else. That is, they are there for another reason, (laughs) but also test positive for COVID. The difference today is that the hospital workforce is greatly reduced relative to a bad flu season. Why is that? According to a survey by Morning Consult, approximately 18% of healthcare workers have quit their jobs since February 2020, while another 12% have been fired or laid off caveat. This is American data. How does this relate to Canada? Well, we've been getting rid of nurses at an alarming rate because they don't want to comply. We've also, I would 
argue, lost a lot of nurses and healthcare professionals because of the poor policy that's been put in place since before the pandemic, because our system is already overstretched. Of course, this was going to rock them to their core. So this is not a failure of individual sacrifice. This is a failure on a massive scale of our public health institutions. So on his show, Peter Tia's show, he got into, I guess, a, he got kind of fired up. and I like that about him. And he's talking about logical consistency. Um, and he brought up a really good point. And um, let me just expand upon it. If you are to be so hysterical about the chances of, of your children dying of COVID that you will double mask them, put a face shield on, not let them go to school, basically dress them up as if they were a, you know, a girl living in Afghanistan with you know, freaking coverings from head to toe, uh, then you need to proportionately uh, be scared of the things that are really, really, really deadly to your children. And the graph that I'm pulling up here is his way of showing this. He took the actual death rate for things like motor vehicle accidents, suicide, homicide, and drug overdose, and just divided it by the amount of deaths in that age category from COVID. Overwhelmingly, you can see here in blue, traffic accidents kill kids from zero to, what is that, 14 years in much greater numbers than COVID, 10 times more. Okay. So if you were to be scared of anything, this is my main concern. I don't drive over a hundred kilometers an hour when my kids are in the car when I'm on the highway. Okay. I make sure they're strapped in. I make sure that I'm well rested. I make sure all the things I could possibly uh, control are controlled. I don't ride on people's asses. I know that car accident deaths are the leading cause of death for my children. So it's not COVID. So if you are hysterical and going crazy about the chance of your kid getting COVID and dying, you should be 10 times more hysterical bringing them in the car to take them to school, take them to hockey, take them to wherever. So be logically consistent. Okay? The next thing is homicide, which is shocking to me, but I guess it makes sense. It's, you know, children are killed by their parents. It's, it's devastating. It's, it's horrible, but it happens. A nine times greater chance of that happening than COVID. And now with the mental health spiraling out of control, we can start seeing that this could potentially go up, which is so troubling. And then as you get older, 15 to 24 years, drug overdoses start taking over. 10 times greater risk of a drug overdose causing death in the 15 to 24 year age range. You go to 20 25 to 34, leading cause of death is drug overdose. 6.6 times greater than dying from COVID. Still two times greater for uh, vehicle accidents, 2.6 greater for suicide, and, and uh, two times greater um, for homicide. Guys, like, I, I, don't know what to, I don't know what to say anymore at this point. If people are, especially our, our, our young people, are dying at, you know, regular rates with respects to just the data that we've been collecting for decades on this stuff, and it's substantially greater than the risk from COVID, then why the fuck have they been shouldering all the responsibility and the burden? It doesn't make any sense. Be logically consistent. And this is where I, my anger gets, gets spiked because at no point do you sacrifice your young generation, your youth, for your elderly. That's not how the system works. That's not how civilization works. The elderly have lived. They have contributed. They have done their time. You make sure that they're okay, but you don't sacrifice the younger generation for them. 
it's a massive miscarriage of moral responsibility to have done this. And this is where I am done with this stuff. And so share this widely. This is a simple graph, but most people won't listen to fact. Speak to the heart. Be like, are you okay with your kids not being okay? That's where it comes down to now. And if you don't have kids, cool. I'm sure you have kids in your sphere. Maybe you're an uncle, maybe you're an aunt. Are you okay with kids not being okay? Are you okay with the actions that we're taking hurting the future of each and every one of our kids? That's a question that it has to be answered. And if you are, okay, that's hard for me to swallow, but your opinion. But I think most human beings, once presented with this cold, hard, troubling fact that our kids are not doing okay and that we've totally blown this out of proportion for them, you're going to have to start asking questions like, okay, well, then why did we have such a disproportionate response? And that's the point of this podcast. Start asking questions, start learning, start figuring things out. So uh, lastly, uh, just to touch back on Monica Gandhi here, she's been a big proponent for mass. And it's good to hear just this conversation because conversation has been completely shut down for fear of vaccine hesitancy and won't be able to uh, achieve mission success with a COVID zero policy. This to me is, is complete nonsense. We've had one of the greatest vaccine rollouts in human history. Most countries have, and I talked about the West, have close to 80 to 90% vaccine uptake, which is incredible. And you're complaining about vaccine hesitancy? That's bunk. That's nonsense. What's happening now is that you have people that are questioning all vaccines because of the heavy-handed approach that I mentioned you know, earlier on in the podcast. When you tell people you have to or you lose your job, people get really concerned. I mean, like, talk to, like, if you've ever dealt with kids, the more you tell them no, the more they say, fuck you. <laughs> like, you got to have the ability to carrot and stick, not just all stick. Because when it's all stick, you go, well, I'm going to get beat anyway, so I might as well give you the middle finger and do what I'm going to do anyways. And that is exactly what's happening. The failure to understand human beings at a fundamental level, you'll never have 100% uptake anything. You could say, hey, look, man, all you need to do is fill out this form and I'll give you a million dollars across the board. No questions asked. You still have 20% of people that's be like, mm, I don't trust it. No, I'm not going to do it. Be like, no, I'm literally getting, look, the guy next to you got a million dollars. Just sign the form. You'd be like, no, I'm not going to sign it. Don't trust you. That is humanity. That is who we are. Rather than smashing them with a hammer, give them a carrot or something else that they like. I don't know. Burger. I don't know. But don't make it so that they dig their heels in. And this is where we're at now. That's why we're in such a disastrous situation now. And that's why I'm going to be supporting the truckers later. Anyways, to get back to Monica Gandhi, um, she made it very clear. Personal protective equipment is to protect the person, not the other person next to you. This has been lost in the sauce. So moving forward, if you are concerned, if you are worried that you're going to get sick, even though you have your vaccines, even though we have awesome antivirals, even though we know more about this virus than I guess any other virus in the last two years, if you're still concerned, okay, put your mask on. However, don't think that it's a magic bullet. Don't think that it's going to protect you at 100%. They don't. The only masks that work really well are the N95 that have a nose piece. They've been proven to uh, show that you have a decreased uh, ability to get infected if you have one of those on. So if that's, your, if that's your case, cool. But to mandate everybody else to say you must wear it based on the flawed hypothesis that you're going to prevent transmission, it's a wash. And I'm just paraphrasing what she's saying that no, they, like, I mean, that, that doesn't make any sense. If you're concerned, put your mask on, especially immunocompromised people, people are going to cancer therapy. They would be the ones that would wear a mask from here on out. But if you're young, you're healthy, or you're just like, man, I don't really care. Like, like I got it. It was like a little cold. Then why, why, why would I wear a mask? Like, you know, like it doesn't make any sense. So therefore personal protective equipment, much like I've been saying since the start is to protect you not the other person, same as vaccines. Okay. The vaccine isn't to protect the other person. 
just like me when I was going on patrol, my armor didn't protect Buddy next to me. It protected me from getting shot in the chest. Or I shouldn't say it protected me not from getting shot, but from getting injured from getting shot. And hence the reason why we have personal protective equipment. It's in the name. It protects you. And we've been gaslit into thinking that, oh, if we wear a mask, we're going to prevent transmission from another. There, there's no evidence that that happens. The evidence shows that if you wear one, it prevents you from getting sick potentially. But ultimately, the most important thing that you can do to prevent yourself from getting really sick or dying is being fucking healthy. Eat well, lose weight, take your vitamins, get outside. Point final. Your immune system is a reflection of how healthy you are. And I've been hammering that point from the start and I will continue to hammer it. To get that information out to the public is what I'm doing and I'm doing my best, but it's up to you to actually take action. So from this point on, you know, what are you going to do to improve your health? What are you going to do to not live in fear? These are all important aspects. And I didn't even touch on the fact that fear and anxiety compounds the effects of being sick with COVID-19 and any disease. (sighs) So look, my rant's over, but to summarize, we've blown this whole pandemic out of proportion based on risk and stratification of that risk. Young people have a significantly lower risk of any complications from this to the point where it is almost criminal to keep them out of school and masked up. Next, there is a clear, clear body of evidence that we're doing significantly more harm to our children and young people than the actual virus itself. And that needs to change. Additionally, in the UK, we're seeing that the amount of people that died of COVID is eight times less than those that died with COVID, which implies that across the board, we may have overreacted and created devastating consequences that are going to be felt for decades to come based on really, really shitty data analysis. And that, I think, is where we're going to wrap up. So if you want to get the links to the articles that I presented here and have a listen to Dr. Peter Tia's podcast, which I highly recommend you do, I think it should be mandated for every Canadian across the board. You can find the links in the brief show notes that are here on your favorite podcast player. Actually do it. I highly recommend you do. Uh, He's got a great podcast and he's got great guests and it's to the point and it will help make your life a little bit easier knowing that there are smart people making smart decisions and that are pushing back because it's the right thing to do. So that's it for me, folks. Head out to Ottawa. If you're listening to this today on Friday, head out to Ottawa. Try to get in, man. It's going to be intense. It's going to be crazy. We don't know where this is going, but it's a massive, peaceful protest to bring our country back to normal. Can't wait to be a part of it. Hope to see you there. And don't forget, train hard, fight easy. See you next time. Peace. Thanks for listening to the podcast. You can find out more about training, nutrition, and mindset at DaveMorrow.net. Be sure to like us on Facebook and Instagram at DaveMorrowPT. And don't forget, strong people are hard to kill.